The best or worst memorial of this regrettable period of history is found in our first feature-length film, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. The disclaimer that Griffith ran at the beginning of the film was belied by the film's advertising posters, which reflected its real content. In his film, the Ku Klux Klan are the heroes and the freedmen are the villains. The one virtue of this appalling film is its historical accuracy. Initially, the Klan must stay underground, raiding only at night. But the freedmen fight back, resisting and ambushing the Klan. The freedmen's success, however, proves temporary. The leaders of the Klan hit upon a simple response, and Griffith invented the Burning Cross as a small rallying point for the Klansmen who carry out the orders. The disarming of the freedmen proves a success for the Klan, and it need no longer remain underground. Isolated assassinations are replaced by shows of massed force. The last is used to ensure that the freedmen are stripped of all remaining political rights. The, the film depicts the, uh, one of, one of the, you know, the most horrible uh, uh, periods in, in American history. Uh, depicts the, um, s the situation that, or depicts a situation where individuals could not rely on the state, where the state was uh, in various jurisdictions in, in cooperation with essentially a domestic terrorist organization. Uh, uh, the, the film prompts the resurgence of uh, the, that, that very organization, uh, an organization that, that begins um, its, its recruiting efforts uh, in, in earnest uh, as, as the film becomes popular and uh, develops a membership in the millions. When the civil rights struggle renewed in the 1950s and 60s, the process had to be reversed. That civil rights workers packed arms and defended themselves remains an untold story of the era. How widespread was armament among civil rights workers? Well, the morning that I came in to my office and told my story about having been followed the night before, uh, you know, everyone in the chorus just said, you fool, why don't you have a gun? And I said, well, do you? And the answer from everyone, from the secretary to the manager of the unit was, of course, there are people trying to kill us. <laughs> uh, and one of my fellow employees said, here, take this one. I have another in the car. As a civil rights worker in the South in the early 1960s, I carried guns for my own protection and for the protection of my clients. Um, I have no idea whether carry was legal or illegal in North Carolina at that time. I suspect, based on what I know now, that it probably wasn't. But there were trying people out there trying to kill me. <laughs> and I wasn't going to go into a dam uh, and be discovered by the FBI months later. Uh, you know, if they were going to, to take me, they were going to have a fight on their hands. Uh, I actually had to use it in two separate occasions. Uh, the same sort of thing. People would pull up, uh, follow the vehicle, get very close. Uh, at this point, they knew who I was. Uh, and, uh, you know, what you, you take your gun out, you hold it up <laughs> in the headlights in front of the rearview mirror, and you wave it back and forth. And amazing things happen. Their headlights dim. Their car backs off from yours, uh, and you're able to drive away. Uh, why? Because you know thugs don't like to run into people who are going to cause them any problems.